last time we talked about kind of the the grody details of of how the RF pulse works. So it's a uh, you have this transmitter, it makes one frequency, and then the transmitter has the ability to modulate the strength of that one frequency. And depending on how you do that, you get you could get like a frequency selective uh, pulse that just has a narrow band of frequencies in it. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is a whole bunch of a whole bunch of practical things about uh, selecting a slice. Uh, RF pulses uh, used to select a slice, and this could easily expand into you know a number of lectures because there's a whole bunch of different uh, RF pulse types. Uh, they have all different strange names like you know uh, SLR pulses, and uh, so uh, so we're not going to talk about those. But we'll just talk about a couple main things. Uh, you know. When we do the gradient, how do we sort of fix that up? Some of the different, a few different, you know, types of RF pulses. Uh, how does interleaving work? Uh, how does that sort of interact with motion, you know, in the scanner when you select a slice and the person's moving? Uh, there's a bunch of quick and dirty scans that happen right before. Uh, you do the main scan. What what, what are those uh, for? You know, how do you tilt a slice, uh, and then fat sat fat saturation? How do you sort of deal with uh, deal with fat? So that's the uh, the topics for today. So we'll start off. Uh, so we'll start off with with our the the fixer. Yeah, the fixer. So what is the what is the fixer? So one thing that you know when we talked about uh, doing our RF pulse. So here's our RF pulse. And say, say that RF pulse was a, was a sync pulse. So it looks something like this. Um, and th that's, I've drawn it out big here, but it's actually quite a short amount of time. It might only be, it might only be like a millisecond or something like that. So thousandth of a second, this whole thing. Uh, and uh, is played out over. And in order to select a slice, we have to turn a gradient on, some, some gradient. And so I say if we turn on the, the Z gradient, which changes the Z when you move in the Z direction, that would select, since the Z axis is kind of like you know, the, the length of the bore, that would select a, a slice perpendicular to the bore. So, um, and so if you're you know, if the person is in there, how does how does their brain look like when they're in there? They're sort of, uh, you know, here's their eye right there, and so they're they're looking forward. But typically, when you put them in the magnet, um, you know, they're I drew it backwards. Their uh, their brain is uh, like this, and there's their eye, and and they're looking up, and so here's the magnet. And so, if you do a if you do a, a, a Z gradient, that will select uh, you know what's called a you can call that a horizontal slice through the brain. Um, there's other na other names for it, but basically, sort of uh, you know going from the top of the head to the bottom of the head. So during that pulse, we in order to make it. To pick out a particular slice, we have to turn uh, turn a gradient on. And so when we turn the gradient on, so there I turn the gradient on, uh, you might wonder, well, wouldn't that kind of mess things up? Uh, because remember when we talked about gradient echo, if you turn a gradient, a gradient on, it's going to change the precession frequency of all the, of all the uh, spins in the brain. The gradient affects... The gradient does, does, doesn't affect just the slice, it affects the entire brain. And so all different parts of the brain are going to be, um, you know, going to be resonating at different frequencies, which is a bad thing because that will make the signal go away. So you'll substantially mess up all the nice spins that were all in phase that were put into phase by the RF pulse. <laughs> so at the same time as you're injecting some RF energy to cause all those spins to precess 
all in unison with each other, you're turning a gradient on, and that gradient is doing the exact opposite. It's causing them to precess at different frequencies. So you'll see this a lot when you look at, you know, practical sequences in the scanner. We have to fix that. And so there's a little fixer. And so what we do is afterwards, we, we turn a little gradient on to, to fix it. And it's usually smaller than the, than the first gradient. And w the rationale for this is that when you turn the RF on at the very beginning, it's not sweeping too many spins into alignment with each other. And toward the end, a lot of them are in alignment. And it turns out if you do some messy math, you can actually show that when you turn an RF pulse on like this, you can sort of assume that it started in approximately the middle of the RF pulse. That's also where the RF pulse has the most energy. And so if you do that, then what we need to do to fix the damage to the spins that we did by having the gradient on is just take the same area here. So, so make those two things the same area. And then that, that's a little fixer, or sometimes they call it a, a rewinder, <laughs> uh, to sort of like wind, wind the spins back up into all alignment with each other. And so you see this a lot where you, you do something, it causes some damage, but you, you needed to do it, and then you sort of fix it up afterwards. There's a whole bunch of stuff like that going on. And so, so anytime you do a, a slice select pulse, you're going to have to sort of fix the damage that you did to the spins afterwards in order to go on and, and use that. So that's something you always, uh, you always see. So uh, fixer, so we dealt with the fixer there. Okay, so, so what about the different, uh, different types of RF pulses? So I said there was like a whole, you know, Shiner, LaRue, all these different kinds of uh, complicated RF pulses, but let's just talk about three three main ones, you know, that people use a whole lot. And, and just to try to sort of get a feel for, for how they work. And so um, what we want to plot here is the, uh, the, pulse, the pulse envelope. Uh, envelope. Because remember, um, we said that, you know, whatever the, the shape of the single frequency coming out of the neurotransmitter, the, the, the actual shape of that envelope is what, um, is what controls the frequency uh, distribution. And, uh, and then over here, we can look at the frequency spectrum. And so the frequency spectrum is... Um, the simplest thing is, well, let's just do, let's just do a Fourier transform of this pulse envelope, and that will tell us basically what the frequency content of the pulse is. And so, one of the most common pulses uh, is just to turn on the neuro, the, the neuro, I just keep saying the neurotransmitter, you turn on the transmitter for just a very short period of time, like this, like you know, one millisecond or. Uh, couple hundred microseconds. So what does that mean, you know, in real life? If we blew it up, what it would look like is here's the pulse, you know, here's the pulse envelope. And so what would happen is you'd turn the transmitter on and it's going to go back and forth, you know, at 123 megahertz or whatever. That's supposed to be the same frequency and then turn it off. So, it, so, th so the envelope is this kind of rectangular envelope of just turning the transmitter on. So what frequency content does that have? So last time we said if you did something that was sort of shaped like a, like a sync pulse, uh, that Fourier transforms into a band of frequencies. Here we've got sort of the reverse. W what, is, what is that envelope function? That envelope function is, you know, rect. It's, it's a rectangle uh, function. And we know from the previous discussion that that Fourier transforms to a sync pulse uh, in the frequency domain instead of the pulse envelope domain. And so, so what does that, uh, that look like? So uh, basically, that looks like a sync. 
But remember how the Fourier transform works. So if we make a very narrow thingy on this side, you get a really wide one on this side. If you make a, a wide one on this side, you know, like a wide, you know, rectangular pulse like that, then you would get a narrow one on this, a narrow sink on this side. So since, uh, since we don't have a, a wide one, we've got a, a very narrow one. What does that do? That makes, that basically makes a very wide sink. So I, I'm not drawing it as wide as it should be. It should be even wider than this. But if, you know, it, it makes like a really wide, so it's, it's making something that looks like this, but it's real wide, like super wide. And so what is, what is that? That's kind of everything. So you can sort of think of this pulse. So this pulse is sometimes called, you know, a hard pulse. Because every once in a while, I mean, not every once in a while, but uh, a lot of times you want to do gazillion pulses. Like, what if I need to do 500 RF pulses? I don't have time to play out, uh, play out a whole sink. And if I can get away with doing a hard pulse, I'll do that instead. And so what, is, what does that mean? Well, this is... This is time over here, and now we're in the frequency domain, so that means that it stimulates the entire brain. Stimulates, it, it stimulates all different frequencies. So even if you've got a, uh, a gradient on that is causing the different parts of the brain, say in the z-axis, to resonate at different frequencies, when you hit it with something like this, uh, essentially everything will be stimulated. So this is commonly used. A lot of times we want to just hit everything in the brain, you know, cause the entire brain to generate a signal. And so it's actually making a sink, but the sink is so wide, it might as well be everything. Sort of in the limit of like making in infinitely small pulse here, then you would have every completely everything. But in practice, it's everything. So that's commonly done if you want to stimulate the whole brain, especially for a 3D scan where every data point comes from the entire brain instead of a slice. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our, uh, you know, uh, non-selective hard pulse. So that, that's commonly used. Uh, but then we might want to do an actual slice like we talked about last time. And so that would be, you know, called a sync pulse. And so what does that look like? So in that case, we put the sink on this side. So, so here's, here's the sink on this side. And that Fourier transforms into a rect on the other side. So this is, uh, this is the Fourier transform going this way, you know, back and forth. Ft, Ft going here. So... In this case, that will make a slice for us. Um, so that's going to make, you know, it'll Fourier transfer. It won't be a perfect slice. It'll be sort of like, it's got a little bit of a little smear like that. Something like about like that. So that'll make a slice. And so, um, so we'll come, uh, I'll come back to talking about what we might need to do because the slice isn't perfect. But let's just put the third, third very common one that you can select, which is uh, Gaussian. So the, the Gaussian pulse, you know, the Gaussian has this strange property that if you, if you put a Gaussian in one domain and you do a Fourier transform of it, uh, you get a Gaussian in the other domain. <laughs> so, uh, so say, let's make a nice sharp little Gaussian, something like that. So that's, you would think maybe that one wouldn't be as good as a, as a sink pulse. And in some respects it isn't because if you look at the next slice over, you're going to have to have a bit of a space. You have a little, a little bit of a gap. So like maybe like a 50% gap so that there won't be too much overlap area. Um, Whereas you, that's less of a problem if you have kind of like a um, a sink on this side that transforms into a into just a slice. 
So those are three main types, you know, just a, a completely non-selective pulse that just hits everybody, all different frequencies. Uh, a sink, which transforms into like a rectangle, more or less. Or a Gaussian, which transforms into a Gaussian. And, you know, the Gaussian, if you want to make a narrower Gaussian, you, you make, you play the, this is all, this is all time on this side. You play out that pulse over a longer period of time, make a wider Gaussian, and that makes a narrower one over here. And so this is, this is frequency on this side, but that sort of corresponds to, uh, to x, right? So it corresponds to how thick the slice is. So if you make a, a wider frequency band here, that's you're hitting, uh, you know. So so it's it's more or less like the actual sort of thickness of the slice, you know, in whatever axis you're in. So it's like it's like x. Okay, so those are the, the pulses. And so one of the things, the, what the main types of pulses, so one of the things that people often do is, is called interleaving. And so what, is, uh, what does that mean? So, so one of the problems with a pulse like this is the Fourier transform equation that says a rectangle transforms into a sink, or vice versa, assumes that um, so the rectangle is easy because it's zero everywhere else except, you know, right where the pulse is, but the sink goes on forever. But obviously, you've only got one millisecond, so you can't make it go on forever, and so you have to cut off, you have to cut off the sink at some point. And when you do that, you end up with something that's not quite, we could go over the math, but basically you end up with something that's is not quite a perfect rectangular pulse. And so what happens when you do the next slice, if you do the slices in order, then what happens is there's a little bit of overlap between those, like that. A little overlap there, a little slop. And so what, is, what does that do? That actually is quite a big hit on your signal because uh, what happens is if you, if you hit the spins in this slice, uh, you saturate them, especially if you do like a 90-degree pulse. And so that means that it's going to take it's going to take like a couple seconds before the longitudinal magnetization grows back. And, but if we're recording slices rapidly, like, you know, 10 a second or something, that's not uncommon. You, you record 10 slices a second. Well, there's, right in this overlap, some of these guys would have been slammed down to zero longitudinal magnetization. And so now if you hit them again, there's nothing there. And so... So one way of dealing with that is uh, just record every other slice. So the idea is you, you, know, you record this slice, then skip one, and then record this slice. So just record this slice, and then skip one, and then record this slice, and skip one, and record this slice. And then after you've done that, which takes up a reasonable amount of time, say a second or two, something like that, then you come back. So, you know, you, you record like, you know, one, three, five, you know, et cetera, and then, you know, and then do uh, two, four, six. So that's, that's called interleaving. And that's a pretty substantial increase in your signal, maybe, oh, like 30%. It's quite a bit. So it's a pretty big big increase because the slices are kind of a little mushy at the, at the edges. And so when you do this, what happens is the ones uh, in between, like you, you slightly went over the edge right here, but that's okay because you're going to not record slice four until a second later, and so we'll have a chance to recover. So, so that's, that's called, you know, interleaving. And if you want more signal, that's a good thing to do. Uh, but now the problem is, what if you got a thrashing kid in the magnet? <laughs> and so we have uh, uh, we have um, a little camera that looks in the magnet, and you know, it's been known to occur. Like you look at the camera, and there's no kid in there. You go like, get back in the magnet. <laughs> you know, they actually wriggled their way out in the middle of a scan. Uh, it, it, it can happen. And so. But say they weren't doing that. Say they were just sort of thrashing around, sort of moving around, uh, uh, swallowing, doing stuff. Uh, so what, what can happen if we're interleaving? So if we're interleaving, 
So let's just, I'll, I'll sort of like draw it a motion much bigger than, than actually occurs. So, so now what happens is we recorded the 1, 3, 5 slices. So here I'll draw the 1, 3, 5 slices again. So, here's, so we stimulated the 1, 3, 5 slices, and now they're recovering. Uh, they're recovering, but now, uh, now we come in and stimulate the two, four, six slices. But remember, the slices are in the same position uh, as they were before relative to the scanner. And so, so here's the here's the two, three, four, the two, four, six slices. So now what's going to happen? Well, it's not going to look good. <laughs> so what's going to happen is this part of the 246 slice is going to ha have already been sort of hit by the uh, by the, the 135 interleave. And so that's going to be darker. And then this part wasn't hit, so it would be a lot brighter because it's had more chance to recover. And so the bottom line is, should you use interleaving? Uh, well, it just depends on how thrashy your subject is. So, you know, if your subject is really thrashy, it might be better to just do sequential because what happens there is if the, if the person moves during sequential, there's going to be a bad slice. No, no doubt about it because you might have moved a slice that you already stimulated into the, into the plane of the next slice. But it's less of a, it's a more local effect. So it might like trash one or two images but uh, here, you, you might trash all the interleaved images. They're going to end up with stripes in them. So, so whether or not you use it to increase your signal to noise depends on kind of your sort of Bayesian expectation of how bad the subject is. And so, like, I do a lot of visual mapping, and I do it on subjects, long-suffering subjects like myself. And I stay very still in there, and I always use interleaving because I want more signal. Uh, because 30% more signal is substantial amount of signal. You, to, to get that, you'd have to double the number of scan, of scan, double the scan time. So in other words, I can sort of essentially get away with you know half the scan time with 30% more signal because the repetitions is under the square root. So so whether or not you use that is it's it has to do with sort of like how how twitchy the subjects are, or or you know maybe there's some other method of, of, of fixing that, which we'll talk about. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, about you know, motion. So, so motion is always occurring. Every time you, your heart beats, your, your brain goes, <laughs> it actually does this. <laughs> it goes like, whoa, whoa. It actually expands a little bit uh, every time the blood pumps in there. Uh, if you breathe, that's going to change the oxygen level, but it will also slightly change the angle of your head because every time you breathe your head will have a tendency to sort of do this do something like this and then you might swallow <coughs> when you swallow in there like as soon as you go in the magnet that's the first thing you think like boy i kind of got a lot of spit in there I, I really need to swallow i wasn't thinking of swallowing before i got in there but now all i can think about is i need to swallow <laughs> so then you swallow that's going to move or you might cough in there or sneeze that's happened so um so how do you fix that so there's several several ways of fixing it. So so motion is like the biggest problem uh, with functional MRI or even other kinds of MRI. So one way to fix it that's very commonly used is uh, just post hoc. So just line up line up stuff afterwards. So so basically, you if you're recording a whole volume of the brain every second or two, uh, all you do is you just pick out a volume that looks like it's one that wasn't all motion artifacted and then just align all the other volumes to it. And this is routinely done. There's software for doing this. It should be a rigid transformation because the brain shouldn't change size very much. I mean, there's little pulsations, but on, on average, it's not going to change size. So you can sort of just try to rotate and translate, but no scaling of the brain. So, so that's commonly done. Uh, one thing we have on our scanner, there's something called 
pace, which can't, I can't remember what it stands for, but uh, I call this one one behind. One behind fix. So how does this one work? So this one works, you start off with, you start off with a volume like this. So here's a volume. That's supposed to be a whole brain. So that's uh, time T1. And then you record another volume, time T2. And the subject might have moved. And so, so what you do is you, you, you very quickly align that guy. So align that guy, just this, doing the same kind of thing, but just do it quickly, like just in a, mil a couple milliseconds. <laughs> you only got a couple milliseconds to do it, but you have a, a fast video card processor. So quickly align. So reconstruct that image. You got to do the Fourier transform. So reconstruct it, qu uh, quickly align it back to that one. And then take that um, uh, alignment uh, information and feed it back into the magnet. So take this alignment and feed it back into the gradients. So feed it back into the gradients uh, and the RF frequency. And what does that do? That will essentially undo the motion that occurred so that when we record uh, time point three, it, it's been removed. So basically feed that back into the gradients, you know, so align and, you know, calculate the gradients and do that right here uh, so, that, so that by the time we record slice three, it's, it's removed the motion that occurred from one to two. So you can see why it's, it's always one behind. So like you record one, record two, align two to one, fix the motion that occurred between one and two, and then now you've got a a motion corrected three. And then what do you do after that? Well, the same thing. So now align three back to two, and then take that information, uh, you know, feed it into the gradients, uh, and then uh, rotate all the gradients quickly before you record four. So. So now here's, uh, here's four. And just keep doing that. So you're always one behind, but you're sort of like dealing with, dealing with the motion. So now there's a problem because obviously the motion that um, occurred that you used to estimate what the motion between uh, you know, T1 and T2 was to fix T3 hasn't been corrected because of the one behind. And so what do you do afterwards? So afterwards, do number one. So afterwards, uh, do, do number one. So uh, run another motion correction on it to, to, to take care of the ones that were used to estimate the motion error, but themselves were not corrected. So that works reasonably well. Actually, that's, I, I usually, uh, turn that one on when I'm doing scans. It, it works less well if there's a really big movement, but for small movements, it's quite, it's quite good. I mean, some of the kind of movements you get are like you slowly fall down into the, uh, uh, into the head coil, which is kind of a, because like the foam slightly compresses over like a half an hour. It's good for that, and it's good for relatively small sort of breathing-like movements. So, that's one behind. What about, what about uh, you know, some kind of video motion detector? And so we have one of these at the magnet. It's it's a it's a video system that um, it works best if you make a bite bar with a little thingy on it that the motion camera can see. And then several motion cameras look at it and figure out where your head went to. The, the, the advantage of a bite bar is that uh, your teeth are firmly attached to your brain. Wherever your teeth are going, your brain is going. <laughs> so the uh, teeth do not move relative to the brain. The upper teeth. The lower teeth do. They're, they're flapping around the breeze. But the upper teeth are, are... The brain is always in the same coordinate system as the upper teeth. <laughs> but that's kind of a pain in the butt because, you know, you've got to have like... A, you have to make a bite bar. 
And so what you, one thing you can do is you can put a little marker on the, the person that, has, that sticks on their nose, and hopefully they don't do this, that moves the marker around. Another way you could do it is like put a bunch of little spots on the person's face and then do some software to sort of figure out uh, to get rid of stuff like that and, and use multiple spots to try to decide where the head went to. And the idea is that what you do is you just feed this back in. So feed back into gradients um, prospectively. So a motion occurs and in a 60th of a second, you instantly feed back in uh, the information. So this is called prospective motion correction. You know, it's like before collect data. Now, obviously, if you're right in the middle of collecting data, that's going to screw you up. But you can do this in about a 60th of a second. And so um, it's so before collect data. Uh, so that one's potentially better because that's going to, it's not going to be one behind. It's only going to be a 60th of a second behind instead of a, like a second or two behind. So there's the, the problem with this, of course, you've got to put the extra doodads on in order to allow it to, to do this. And what currently there's, there's um, people working on, let's not put any markers on. Let's just like take a good picture of the face and then try to actually figure out like what parts of the face are actually movable relative to the skull, which ones aren't, and let's let's do some sort of computer vision stuff to just try to figure out where the head went to. Remember, you've got you have to get a lot of information there. You've got to get information about like you know three rotations and then three translations. So you need like six numbers, or four or six depends on how you formulate it. But you need like you know there's a reasonable amount of data you need, and it has to be pretty accurate down to you know, like well under a millimeter. So it's, it's not trivial to, to do this, but that's, that's another way of doing it. It's better than this one because it's not, you know, it's only a 60th of a second behind instead of a couple seconds behind. Um, and then there's yet another way of doing it, of trying to fix it, and that's generally called um, navigators. And so what are navigators? So navigators are something that, um, it's some additional data that you collected that tells you where the head went to before you collect the data. So potentially this is, it, it could potentially be something like, like the video motion detector where it could fix it before you actually collect the, uh, the data and it wouldn't be one behind. The problem with, th so this one is very general. You could apply this to any old kind of pulse sequence with the video. This one's a little less general because you've got to collect some additional data so if you've ever been in the magnet, um, there's a common sequence called MP-RAGE for making a structural scan. And what it sounds like, it's, it's kind of an inversion recovery scan. And so you hear like, you know, so like the, when it's going, that's actually collecting, you know, hundreds of lines of case space. And then um, there's a little gap. And what's happening in the gap, so you're basically collecting like, and then there's a gap. What's happening in the gap is you've done a 180. You've done a 180 right here. And you're waiting for inversion recovery to occur. So remember, that works like, you know, you, you do a 180 and you wait until, you know, one of, one of the tissue types has, has, has recovered to zero and the other tissue type has recovered above zero. And then you do, then you do your uh, to record all the data. And so that, that kind of scan is, is a good kind of scan because what you could do is you could, like before the 180, for instance, you could just do a quick and dirty little scan here to uh, collect some data. Um, like you could collect like a sphere in K-space. <laughs> and it turns out just a sphere in K-space, which you could collect pretty quickly, just in a couple milliseconds, uh, has enough information in it to tell you like where the head is rotated to. The phase will tell you where the where the head is translated to, and the sphere itself will tell you where the head is head is you know compared to the last time you did it will tell you where the head is rotated to. And then you could feed that information back in, just like we did with with this one here. Feed it back into the gradients and and fix things. So 
so there's a lot of work in this as well uh, to try to essentially record some additional data that tells us where the head moved to and then use it to fix the gradients to sort of move the slices around so that it cancels out that movement. So as you can see, given the amount of effort here, this is a huge problem. So movement is the main thing that sort of messes up your... Uh, sleep isn't good either if you're trying to do some <laughs> tasks, sort of some awake task. Uh, but, um, but movement is the biggest, the biggest problem in, in the magnet. So uh, for, for destroying, destroying data. And it can destroy structural data too, because if you're, if you're doing a scan that's do like a 3D scan, uh, then that 3D scan uh, is not constructed until you do like f five minutes of data collection. And so any movement in that entire five minutes is gonna get sort of, is gonna blur your final image if, you, if it takes you a full five minutes to, to reconstruct the image. And that's very, that's in, in the structural scan case where you've got a 3D scan. So we were talking about slices here, but um, there's a lot of scans where you do a 3D scan where you do uh, a hard pulse and uh, excite the whole, the whole brain. And so every data point comes from the whole brain. Uh, in that case, if there's any movement, that movement is kind of messing up your case-based data. And so, so 3D scans have a lot of advantages from some, some kind of prospective. You can't do this pace thing on a 3D scan because the da there's, there's only one image across five minutes, and so there's nothing to align with. And so some kind of method of you know, video or some kind of navigator method is, is important for trying to correct motion that occurred during a scan that takes five minutes just to make one you know, volume of the brain. Okay, so any questions about um, about uh, motion uh, for we uh, move on. Oh, so pulse sequ uh, the different kinds of different kinds of pulse sequences you know interleaving uh, the scourge of uh, of motion all different kinds of things have been tried back in the day we used to use a bite bar where we would have a little rig that would have a bite bar that was bolted to the scanner that you could sort of adjust and then lock into place so that you could actually keep yourself completely still. Uh, but somehow the, somehow the average subject was not happy about the bite bar. One of the things is it makes you salivate a lot and then you swallow more and then that's worse. <laughs> so the best thing is just to get a, a, a good subject that has a real Zen approach and can just go in there and just stay completely still like a like a statue and you can even get some kids like that uh, and then there's some other kids that no matter what you do they're gonna move <laughs> so it's gonna be harder to scan but any any questions about sort of motion or types of RF pulses We're, we're trying to convince the undergraduates to get skull piercings. That's the latest thing. And we can just bolt you into the magnet. <laughs> Stay real still. That's what... Uh, yeah, the problem with staying really still is that, you know, it's, if you put a lot of padding in, it can get a little uncomfortable because you're, you're putting a lot of pressure against the, against the skin. That's one advantage of teeth. Teeth are used to a lot more pressure. You can, you can easily bite something with a hundred pounds force. So they're used to dealing with more pressure. But the bite bar is kind of a pain in the butt. Okay, so pre-scans. So what kind of scans, when you fire up the scanner, the first thing it's going to do um, is run a super quick and dirty scan, just basically one RF pulse, uh, in order to find out what the center frequency is, experimentally. And why, do, why is this done? So this is uh, frequency pre-scan. So this is done before every single scan. And in fact, with, with a, a functional MRI scan, it's done before every slice. 
So, so why do you need to do this? Well, I told you, like, you know, you put the magnet, you put the current into the magnet, and the magnet, it just stays in there. It's not plugged in. It stays in there for 10 years. You know, it's been in our, our magnet. has had the same current in it for, for a very long time. Um, but it turns out it does ever so slightly go down. So, you know, it's supposed to be like 2.89 Tesla. But if you look at it, it's slowly ticking down. I'm way exaggerating how much it ticks down, but every single day, in fact, every single hour, the magnetic field gets slightly less. Now, it's not, you know, it's parts per million. We're talking about or less than one part per million, but we're relying on that frequency being exactly correct. And any reduction in that frequency is going to cause a phase difference, which will cause we know from the Fourier transform, it will cause the image to shift. And so if you don't correct for that, even just during a five-minute scan, the, the, the brain will actually move a visible amount, like one voxel, uh, because that field slightly went down. Now, the field will last for 20 years uh, in the magnet, no problem. So it'll be like 2.89, but then, you know, like way down at the, at the fifth or sixth digit, it's, it's, it's slowly going down. So how do you fix that? So before you do any scan, you just do a quick and dirty RF pulse. So, um, so what do you do? You just do you know, a hard pulse. And whenever you turn the scanner on, you'll hear this little tick. It's just like that's all you hear, just this little tick. And it's just a little quick RF pulse. And what does the scanner do? It just does a Fourier transform you know, of the data that you get from that hard pulse. And what do you get? You basically get the distribution of all frequencies in your head. And maybe, it's, you know, maybe there's a little fat in there, so there's a little, little peak for fat, which is a different, resonates at a different frequency. So this is, the, this is just like a chemist would do. You just did a hard pulse, you hit all different frequencies, and then you just recorded what came back. And you did a Fourier transform of it, and it just tells you, you know, here's the frequencies of resonance in your head. And so then what the scanner does is it looks for the, you know, the sharpest peak, and it sets, it sets the transmitter. So, you know, set transmitter to this frequency, and it does that uh, every single scan to this frequency. And you can see that. It's right on the interface. It says, like, you know, it says 123.074336, blah, 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 is, is the transmitter frequency, the center frequency. And so it does this every time. Uh, so, so that's the very first thing we have to do, just figure out empirically what the center frequency is, what the... It's essentially like figure out what is the, you know, what is the actual B0 field. That's as effective as what you're doing. And, you know, so, so that's done every single time. Very, very quick thing that happens. Um, then, um, uh, you know, we might want to know how much signal is going to come back. You know, how much signal. Because uh, there could be huge differences uh, between different uh, uh, different kinds of uh, of pulse sequences, you know, maybe you're stimulating the whole head. That's going to make a big signal, or maybe just doing a little thin slice. That's going to make a much more tiny signal. So you need to know, like, you know, how much signal do we get back when we're going to digitize it? Uh, uh, but then we need another thing, which is also s determined empirically. So this is basically just to empirically determine what the center frequency is. This one down here is to empirically determine, you know, what is RF transmitter power for 90 degrees. So that's not known either. Uh, so why is... Why is that not known? Well, if you put different kinds of stuff in the magnet, different people with different body weights, people with different fat distribution, uh, di different, you know, different sizes, different sizes of distribution of, of what, how the tissue is arranged, 
the same transmitter power is going to give you a different flip angle. And so one way to, to sort of try to figure out what's going on here, uh, this, this is way too slow, but it gives you an idea of, of what we're trying to figure out. So, so basically, if we wait a long time, if we wait a long time and then do uh, so that we're, you know, like wait a, s a couple seconds so that we're all magnitude, magnetization longitudinal, and then we do a flip. We don't know what the flip angle is for 90. And so we just do one that's kind of in the ballpark. And so we get something like this. So if we get something like that, then what we do is we just measure what is the amplitude of our signal coming back. And so here's, here's the amplitude of our signal coming back. That's magnetization transverse. And you can see from this, how do, what, what's a 90? Well, a 90 is the biggest signal because if we overshoot, you know, if I overshoot down to here, what's going to happen is the signal will start getting smaller again. So if I overshoot down here, the transverse, you know, the transverse signal will get smaller. And so you'll get the biggest signal if you just nail it right on 90. So a very slow method of doing this would be just to do a whole bunch of slightly different transmitter powers and then figure out which, which one is the biggest. So that's another thing that is done every single time you do a scan because there's different, you know, uh, there's different stuff in there and the person might have moved in between scans. And so we have to, so basically we just empirically determine what the transmitter power is for 90. And then once you've got that, you can say, well, if that's what 90 is, then I can sort of predict more or less what a 180 is and scale all the other transmitter powers, or like I can predict what a seven degree flip is. But that actually comes by sort of empirically, you know, empirically measuring what is the actual frequencies, that, uh, what, so what is the actual amplitude of the signal that comes back as I change the transmitter power. So it's kind of interesting, like you would think, shouldn't there be some more scientific way of doing this? This is very scientific. It, it actually sort of like takes into account everything, like how big the person is, how much RF they absorb, all that stuff. So that's the, the, you know, the RF uh, transmitter power. Now, uh, uh, pre-scans, basically, you know, th this is our, our pre-scans. So, so what about tilted slices? So if you've ever run a scanner, a lot of times you will, you'll do a quick and dirty scan and then you'll try to set up the slices and you can tilt the slices. So how do you tilt slices? So the way you tilt slices, so say, if we just turn on um, the, so here's you know the person in there, terrible person, okay, there they are, there's their brain, temporal lobe, okay, so if we turn on uh, a Z gradient, then there'll be and then we play a frequency selective pulse, there'll be a little range like that that will uh, be at the right frequency to be stimulated by the RF. And if we turned on, so this was, you know, uh, you know, freak band here for gradient Z. So if I turn gradient Z on, there'll be just a little thin plane that's at the right frequency for the, that, that the transmitter band has been set to. If we turned on a, 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 a Y gradient, we would get something like this. So this would be like a GY. But what if we turned them both on? So if we turned them both on, what you'll get is you'll get a tilted slice. You won't get sort of like a, an X shaped thing, but you'll just tilt a slice you can sort of wor work out why this would be sort of graphically, but basically if you add a certain amount of another gradient, you'll just tilt the slice in the direction of what that other gradient would do by itself. If you turn a third gradient on, you can do that. Uh, then you can just generate any old plane. So by combinations of gradients, you can, you can select any, you know, any plane in any orientation. So that's, that's how you tilt slices. And so how does that work in the pulse sequence? Well, that means like, you know, if, if here's, your, 
here's your sink here. Uh, when you're doing your, your gradients, you're going to have to turn on two gradients. So you'll have to turn on you know, this gradient, and, and then you have to fix that gradient. But then you might have to turn on this gradient. It could be positive or negative at the same time. And that guy, you'll have to fix that guy by sort of doing the opposite of, of that one. Or there might be three gradients on. <laughs> so, so you have complete uh, you know, freedom to you know, select any old, any old orientation. Usually people just tilt it with, with a second gradient. But in the general case, it can be all three. And certainly, if you're doing any motion correction, all three gradients will be, mess be messing around with and having their little correctors in there. OK, so at last negative three minutes, what about fat saturation? What does that mean? So almost any time you record any functional MRI data, we do what's called a, a fat saturation pulse. And so it's kind of it's like saturated fat. Don't eat too much saturated fat. Saturated fat pulse. So why is it, why is it called saturation? What does saturation mean? So saturation just means we did we did a ninety, and that caused all the longitudinal magnetization to go away, and turned it all into transverse, but then the transverse quickly decays away before the longitudinal has had a chance to recover. And so, so the way the fat saturation works is, um, and, and why are we bothering with, with this? So the problem is that, that fat resonates at a slightly different, it's got a chemical, a different chemical environment for the protons in fat versus the protons in, in say, blood or, or water or, you know, saline in, in the brain. And so what, so if you look at a brain in particular, you've got some skin on top and then there's a layer of fat underneath. Everybody's got it. Uh, if you're really fat, sometimes it can get quite thick, like an inch or two, but usually it's usually just like about an eighth of an inch, a couple millimeters. And then you get to the skull. So this is skin. Uh, and then there's skull down here. And then, you know, brain. Uh, but the fat has a different resonant frequency. Uh, so that's fat. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that for a given gradient, it's going to be resonating in a different frequency, which will be interpreted as a phase difference because the spins are going to get a little bit ahead in there as if you had a gradient on. So what that will do when you reconstruct your image, it will move the fat. And so if you don't, if you just record an image, the chemical difference in the resonant frequency of fat will be interpreted as a spatial change. And so the fat will penetrate down into the brain and you'll get a little white stripe of that, that fat uh, superimposed on, on brain because it got displaced because its phase was wrong because it was resonating at a different frequency. And so how do we deal with this? Um, so what we do is, so if, if we look at the, at the spectrum, you'll, you'll see like here's all the, you know, the water protons, but there might be a little spike right there from the fat protons that are at a different frequency. Uh, and so what we could do is we could do an RF pulse that was very frequency spe specific. So if we do a very a good uh, freak specific RF pulse and do that um, before we collect our main data. So the idea is uh, do a, a pulse here that, uh, and we've got to select a slice. So we have to select a slice, just like, and, and fix the slice select. So, so basically uh, do that with the intent to, um, so this is a 90 degree to just hit fat. 
So, so what happens? Well, we're going to get a big signal, right? So this is the gradient. Say that's the gradient Z. This is, you know, RF stim. And this is, you know, RF record. So what's going to happen here is we're going to get a, a, a huge FID from the fat. Uh, but it's going to decay quickly, you know, e to the minus t over t2 star. So that's a quick decay. So we just let it decay. But the longitudinal at this point, uh, you know, ml tiny. So, and then, so after, it's, after the signal is decayed away, we threw out that signal, then we do another 90. So this is you know, a 90 to hit water. Uh, and then we got to do another, another slice select like that. And, and now what happens is we get an FID that we can use. And we could do like an EPI or we could do a spin echo, whatever. But the idea is that we'll just try to blast these guys down to zero longitudinal magnetization, which makes a huge signal, and then we just ignore that signal and then start recording, you know, start recording here. So that's, that's routinely done. Every time you do a functional MRI scan, it's going to have something like this in it. So that's the, that's the fat saturation to deal with the fact that fat has this different resonant frequency. You can still see it. Uh, it's not like it completely takes it out. It's, it, it's still there, but it, uh, it takes a lot of it. It takes a lot of the, the distortion out. Okay, so this was like more actual sort of practical things that actually happen in the, uh, when you're doing all, you know, pulse sequences. You can turn it off. I mean, in the scanner, you know, you can, you can just click off the fat saturation and just see how bad the effect is because you know, people always leave it on in the brain, but if you're doing something in the leg, maybe it's not as much of a problem. So, but you can just click it off and just see, you can just see the, this little fat. Suddenly the fat will just appear displaced. Okay. So any questions in the last negative 10 minutes on sort of these are practical things? Frequency, you know, frequency pre-scan you do every time scan a quick and dirty scan to try to figure out like what is a 90 degree pulse what's the transmitter for 90 degree pulse you can tilt slices you can interleave or maybe you don't want to motion is going to ruin your day no matter what uh, and then the, uh, the, the basic different types of pulse sequences okay i think we'll end our overly long recording there stan 